This week on Rockstar Superhero. Nick Vassallo is a better man than me. He always has something to say and contribute, so our conversation today was lively to say the least. Nick is commonly known through the death metal world as the OG, the original gangster, the one that started this whole thing. I'm not sure if Nick even knows why this has come to pass, but indeed it has. Fortunately, Nick has insight and talent for days, and hanging out for a bit in his world is as eye-opening as it is overwhelming. I would just like to say that this might be my favorite conversation of all time. So thanks to Nick for being a wonderful guest and making it so meaningful to me. This is Nick Vassallo, and this is Rockstar Superhero. I'm really fascinated by the artist's journey. And and yours is really compelling to me because it it seems to be more heavily focused on you know the heavy music business, um, or at least the parts of it that I'm looking at. Um, obviously, you've done a lot of things, but in your life, you know, so many people will you know they'll they'll want to talk to you, they'll want to interview you about how you grew up. But for me, it's more about nature versus nurture, right? Mm-hmm. That's very fascinating to me. Um, it can truly work out for a person either way they're influenced, but I'm curious, you know, in your situation, how did music become a key focus in your life? Were you taught by family or did you sort of figure things out for yourself? Um, you know what? It, it was actually not really encouraged uh, when I was young. My sister learned piano and I used to just listen to her piano lessons. We had a piano and I'd tinker, but I was not any good. You know, I try to copy or emulate what I heard. Um, But then it took, like, I think the big thing that changed was when I was 14, um, I saw Nirvana and uh, I saw Kurt Cobain smash his guitar live. And it was like the coolest thing ever. And I was like, I can do that. And so I I wanted a electric guitar for my birthday. And that's what I got. I got a really cheap, crappy Fender Squire Stratocaster copy. There you Uh, go. And, um, Yeah, and then I just made noise. I didn't even take lessons. It was really bad because I just wanted to be loud and make, you know, sounds. But, uh, yeah, I finally um, started taking guitar lessons at 15 or 16. And, um, you know, I I was leaning towards music, but I thought it was just a hobby. My family was kind of, you know, thinking I would not, you know, go into it and go deep and be a bum, you know, like a musician (laughs) bum. But that's totally changed. (laughs) That was when I was young. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, I have to go with the obvious here. So, my wife is Japanese, mm-hmm. um, and part of Asian culture tends to be pushing towards more traditional roles, right? Um, music is always seen as something that should be encouraged because it it focuses on math and organization and and some of those um, don't quit skills, so to speak, right? Learning learning a craft. Mm-hmm. Um, was that uh, because you said your sister played piano? Was that the only direction you were sort of allowed to move towards? Because it doesn't sound like it was traditionally supportive from an artistic point of view. Yeah, you know, um, you know, they in in hindsight, you know, after studying music and studying music history, I see that music really does balance the soul. Right? We need like the trifecta um, of education yeah. uh, in Greek theory. We had you know, science, um, you know, um, being physical, physical activity and math and music were like considered the same thing. Um, and it just balanced you, but yeah, I I was, I mean, pushed to do other things. I mean, I was doing baseball, you know, like sports stuff, but as far as uh, academics, I was pushed more into, you know, doing math and business and all that stuff, all the things that you would think that, your Asian parents would be proud of you for doing. And last thing they probably wanted me to do is, is being a a metal band touring, you know, (laughs) not going to school. This leads towards the question that I found happens with artists over and over again. There's some sort of independence that occurs and that could be at a very young age where, you know, there's this, the assumption that's, you know, like from a social perspective. So like I grew up in, 
um, rural Washington state. And I'm older than you. So I grew up in that latchkey era where, you know, dad, mom went to work if, if mom worked and the kid stays home. And I mean, I remember very clearly being just five years old and being home by myself. Mm -hmm. And, and that independence uh, can lead to a lot of amazing things, but it also can lead to fear and abandonment issues. And I, I probably carry a little, a little bit of those to this day. So yeah. I'm wondering then, because of the your family culture, and then you know the Asian culture thing, and then just your local culture where you lived, and the way you maybe that your family treated your sister compared to you. Um, I'm wondering if there was a need to feel love that gets amplified, um, which then leads you down that sort of that, you know, heavy, dark road, you know, the metal thing, the death core thing, um, mm -hmm. because that's not necessarily what what uh, traditional artists chase. Yeah, man, that's such a good, deep question. No one's ever thought about asking how my upbringing has molded or directed my path, but um you know, I was also, I grew up in the 80s. I'm, I'm 42 now. Mm -hmm. And my parents did leave me alone uh, uh, starting at the age of six, maybe six or seven. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you find things to do. I mean, you find hobbies to get into. You learn how to cook your own food. Yeah. Right Now I cook every night for my family. I am the chef in the kitchen, um, cook for my kids. Um, but I would say that uh, there is perhaps, I think, being molded by my mom, maybe might, might have been more affected in me wanting to, like, do better, you know, not like I'm a, I'm a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of stories about that growing up, about how not doing as well in certain things would be a huge punishment. Right. Which I struggle at uh, um, uh, dealing with today with my kids. Like, I don't want to be like that with my kids. And it's like you break the cycle, right? Yeah, um, yeah. My sister was totally different. Like I, I was actually a pretty naughty kid. Um, <laughs> I got in trouble a lot, uh, all all up until high school. Um, you know, I can talk about a billion stories. I'm not going to, but sure. Um, but my sister was the complete opposite. She was uh, she's smart. She learned from my mistakes. I think she saw how much trouble I got into, and she did not do the same. So mm -hmm. she stuck to her academics and. I think she was an early bloomer. She did a lot of amazing things in school, K through 12. I think I, I was a late bloomer. I think I did all those things after. Like it took me being kicked out of the house. Oh. At, you know, pretty much to get my shit together. Yeah. I, that'll do it. That'll do it. Yeah. You said break the cycle a second ago. And this this really speaks to me a lot because of my own sort of family stuff. And again, I, I, I apologize. I tend to do this every show. I tend to start talking about my own problems. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I'm a I'm a father, too. I have six children and I have two generations. Wow. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm remarried. I have two generations. So I have older children that are in their early 30s. And then I have little, little kids. I have a 10 year old daughter who actually be 11 tomorrow and eight year old twin boys. And I found that although I am, uh, I, I love them and I, and I know I'm a better father today than I was ever before. Um, there is, um, boy, oh boy, I'm really, I gotta be careful here, <laughs> but I, I, I feel like I have never been able to overcome the things that um, hold me down. I feel like I am a victim. And I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, man, I get it. It's my own fault. But I feel I have victimized myself um, in their life. And then in turn, I haven't necessarily been able to break these chains of of behaviors and the sort of the anomalous stuff that that occurred the first time around. And I so want to fix it. But I truly don't know how to even through you know counseling and whatnot um all that said would you think though that there are good parts about the things like your mom holding you to a certain level of standard because it's not just an asian thing right we want our kids to grow up and to be extraordinary at something we want them to be in love with something and we would like them to be as intelligent as possible so what do you think about that yeah i, I mean i think it's uh, uh it goes both ways um 
when you drive someone or when you kind of mold someone's reactions to be like, I'll just say like, when I make mistakes, I get really upset with myself. Mm. Um, and I'm trying to like, just flow with it. Now. I mean, everyone makes mistakes. So, um, those are one of the things like I try and not make mistakes. I try and, um, exceed things that I expect that I should be doing. So I have high expectations of myself and I, um, I don't know. It sounds like I'm, I'm interviewing for a job right now. I, I'm sorry. I, no, no, no. I'm, I'm talking like the way I'm, I'm talking. Oh, yeah, okay. It sounds like, you know, when they ask you like, what are your negative qualities? I'm like, Oh, I'm a perfectionist and I'm hard on myself. And because I remember when I was interviewing for this job at DVC, they asked me that, uh -huh. and, you know, you want to say the things you're really bad at, but when you're a perfectionist, that's also one of the bad things when you make mistakes, cause you're going to make mistakes. You're going to, mm -hmm make the wrong call you're gonna forget something um so yeah i mean um your question was is it a good yeah it's a good thing because i would say the positive and all that mm -hmm. maybe if i didn't get any of that shit, i wouldn't have a doctorate i wouldn't be in a tenured professor in this college i'm at right now I wouldn't have tried to do my best writing music in yeah. different genres you know yeah, yeah. so it's, it's, I'm fucking grateful, actually. Like, I'm fine, you know? So I'm going to play this for my children <laughs> because I I agree with you a thousand percent. There's something about, so you mentioned it a second ago, your parents raised you with a certain set of standards and now you have children and you want to um, push forward the good parts, but you want to undo the parts that you didn't necessarily agree with, right? And create your own sort of new set of standards. But there is real practical evidence that difficulty um, spurs creativity. You know, it, it, you know, again, it's like being bored at home instead of having an iPad to stare at. You have to think. You actually oh, have yeah. to, right? You have to create with what's in your brain. What you know? How do you envision things? How do you undo the boredom? Right. Um, and so I don't know. I, I think that I think that's what sets you apart, Nick. I mean, I think that's why you're so different from your contemporaries because you were you weren't raised, it sounds like. You weren't raised in a negative home. You were just raised in an intense home that there was that there was they wanted more for you. There's definitely an intense home. I mean, I'll just say my friends and girlfriends were afraid to come over. Oh. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Okay. So, okay. I'm not going to keep on this because I don't want to, you know, make you uncomfortable, but I, I'm so fascinated by that um, because I think, you know, again, the best things seem to come from the biggest challenges. Um, so all this being said, you're in that in, uh, well, you're in many different musical spaces, but again, you're, you've sort of become the spiritual father of death core. <laughs> um, why do you think you receive the accolades for that? You know, what do you think you've done differently than others before you? I mean, at the time when I was in Antagony or when we started, we really didn't try and do anything. I mean, we were just, we, we liked all kinds. And I think a part of it was all that music was so new to me yeah, and so fresh. So, you know, when you fall in love with, I don't know, whatever it is, whatever hobby, whatever passion, when you first fall in love with something, everything sounds fresh and everything you make sounds fresh. Mm -hmm. And you kind of want to like put it all together in one thing. And, you know, I'm the type of person where I want to make something that I want to hear or make something I want to eat, make something I want to use. Those are the things I like to invent, things that I want to have, right? Mm -hmm. So that was what I was really into. I was just getting into death metal, grindcore, metalcore, hardcore, and I was, still, I was coming out of a punk rock hardcore band. So I was like, these are all the flavors I like. And I think that's just what we did. Like I, I'm, all my buddies were into that music too, everyone in Antagony. Mm -hmm. So I think it was something that in hindsight, it's great to get credited for something. At the time, we were just trying to make music that we wanted to hear and yeah. wanted to see, you know? Yeah, but I think I think I think how it worked out for you so well, it was that you not only discovered the tricks in a sense, to go towards exactly what was driving you. And I mean, I guess there's no trick because you just go after it. But 
But the trick is don't over think it don't overindulge right because there's that weird fine line between you know like say deathcore or um phantomos right <laughs> where all of a sudden you're you're doing something so ambitious and so over the top that your your audience becomes you know minutia compared to what you hope right like it's so hard for anybody to find any consistency in it because you're trying too many ideas does that make sense yeah and i mean phantom moss was we, we i still love them but we I love do too. i do too but yeah i can see what you're saying when uh mike Patton may have been making that project very cerebral and we were just 17 18 year old kids wanting to write heavy shit right yeah. we didn't think about it we wanted we wanted brutal breakdowns we wanted crazy blast beats and one thing we that I, actually the one intentional thing that i was trying to do when i was writing these songs was i was like i don't like verse chorus stuff can we not do that stuff and that's when we changed and we wrote just sectionally let's have each riff be its own movement or section and that's something that i think is in my opinion more of a a, a, a musical contribution Mm -hmm. in the background because now when you listen to a lot of death metal or extreme metal bands the formal structures are not as intact as they once were yeah yeah they're all they tend to be very riff intensive right the groovier the sexier the fatter <laughs> yeah and it just evolves so you may not have the first riff ever come back right I mean, yeah you again yeah dream theater does that but they do it wrong they never bring the cool riffs back they just stay on the crappy riffs <laughs> yeah, those guys are epic but i i'm not a i don't really know their music that well no i understand i i kind of like to pick on it because they had a moment you know what i mean and then of course like a lot of bands that that original construct that first those first five members they tend to put out the right thing and then one of them inevitably falls off and then they try for the next 30 years trying to recreate what they did in 1991 if that makes sense oh yeah that happens a lot i mean yeah. i think it happens to a lot of musicians and composers and artists yeah you know? yeah. yeah yeah but you've evolved i mean you know is it apophony is that how it's pronounced yeah okay so that actually came out like 11 days ago was that was that correct yeah Mark, like that? yeah 11 days ago Okay. So what does apophony signify to you? You know, I mean, it's a, is it a, is it a, a subtle shift? Is it a big change? Is it a thumb your nose at society? You know, is it a COVID response? What, what <laughs> is it for you? Well, um, you know, it's funny. A lot of the pieces on there have relevance to things that you could look at today. And that's kind of what the idea of apophony is making connections that aren't obviously related, but subjectively you can make them mm -hmm. so like for instance the, there's a the second track on there when the war began to me that's one of the most intense pieces i've written and i try to do it from from the uh, from the perspective of being someone that's trapped into a, in a village or a small city mm -hmm. and you hear the impending sounds of war coming to you and you can't do anything about it you're mm -hmm. helpless mm -hmm. so that's what that and it's really relevant because people have commented that that piece strikes hard today and it does it sounds scary yeah. um and then uh apophony as and a, a monolithic thing for me is kind of like i don't really feel like i need to belong in any particular genre anymore i think before i was like okay time to write my metal stuff okay time to write my experimental classical stuff now i'm like i'm just gonna write me stuff i want to hear kind of going back to my ethos i had when i was younger just want to write shit that i would like to hear and if yeah. people understand it and dig it great if they don't i, I don't really give a shit you know yeah yeah um so it's me kind of like kind of being cool with my voice and not really caring anymore really but isn't that amazing when when that occurs to an artist when an artist just says this is the thing i've created i've made it for this moment and it's pure isn't isn't that the moment when it typically works out? I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to bring in celebrity or wealth or, or or other things that you know artists try to be rock stars, all these other things. But it seems to me that what you're saying is is when it's pure, it's at its best, and that's when I'm at my happiest as a, as an artist. Yeah, totally. When like like we were talking about before, the less the less I think about it, and the less 
you know, the less an artist maybe has to stew on it, mm-hmm. and, you know, the rest, the, the, the less problematic or the more organic something he feels and is. So, um, yeah, Apophony, it, it was really just waiting to be unleashed. And I was just kind of like, okay, I'm on, I'm going to take a sabbatical. I think this is the time 10 years to the day of my last album. It's pretty appropriate to do this. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's, it's based on your skill set. You know, your, your abilities are so mind blowing and so broad. It almost feels unfair as a fan of your work on the outside. It's like, what took so long? You know what I mean? I mean, do you mind, do you mind sharing a little bit about like how that creative process was or was it, or was it instantaneous and you were just sidetracked with, you know, family and that sort of thing? Yeah, it was a lot. I mean, I started writing this music actually in 2013, right after my 2012 album. Gosh. I was, I was just writing. And then, uh, you know, my daughter Madison was born 2013. Mm-hmm. My, my son Lucas was born 2016. Mm-hmm. I got tenure at two different universities, so I was moving. Um, a lot of life things happened. And then I also decided to take a break when Lucas was born from writing art music and dealing with the art music political world to just go okay I'm, i need a break away from this to focus on my family and write music that feels pure again like like metal so i wrote a couple of oblivion albums you know uh, an antagony album recorded all three mm-hmm. and i needed that kind of pa- or i needed that um time back into extreme metal to death metal to kind of make me love creating again right mm-hmm. working with my friends i mean Composing experimental classical music is a lonely art form. You're sitting in a room alone and just making these things in your head come to life, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. With black and white notes. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I had to send my family away for weekends. I'm like, I got to finish this big piece. Can you just go for a weekend? Because it's impossible to write the stuff with your kids hanging on you. So that's another reason why I was like, I got to peace out for a while just because I want to spend time with my family, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but with the pandemic and the last couple of years, you're home a lot. And like you said, that bored kid at home starts to go in his head and want to create something or do something. And that's why apophony had to happen. You know? Yeah. Do you see every work as a milestone? Totally. Um, yeah. Every work to me is kind of like building a house or mm. even ha- having a baby. You, I have like tunnel vision with the piece where all of my obsessiveness, like I drive in a car and I don't have music on. I have silence so I can just listen to the music in my head. So when I sit down, all of the decisions are already made. I'm just transcribing what's already been solved. If that makes wow. sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this, so this blows me away. I love, I love how everybody has a different approach to how they craft, you know, um, you know, I, I know artists that, you know, they go take walks and, you know, they purposely don't wear headphones. They, they have to be able to communicate with nature. They have to be able to pray. They have to be able to do something spiritual in a sense, right? I, I can't imagine, though, what it's like to have your brain that not only calculates and processes the, these works in your head as you're driving, but then could remain in your brain until you get home. Because I would need to hum it into a phone or something. Well, sometimes actually I do need to, uh, uh, because of technology, we have um, voice dictation. Mm. So I'll get my cell phone and I'll write a blank. I'll, I'll make an email to myself and I'll just splur- I'll, you know, splurge out everything that is going on. Mm. And it's basically uh, uh, a dictation and uh, what's that called? Like narration of events mm. that are happening. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty much how I write music now is if you look at my, if you look at, do I have anything here? If you look at some music that I write, I have it at home. Um, it works. <laughs> but it's like, you'll see staff paper and you'll see scribbles of ideas. And then you'll see everything that happens written out in prose. Like just telling you what, what instruments do, what what's happening, snapshots in time. Mm. And everything's based in time. So I'll know exactly at 45 seconds this happens or three minutes, you know, whatever, all the brass erupt into silence or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So it's it's a story basically when I'm dictating it on the phone and I'm just really, 
I really just think I'm an audience member. When I'm sitting down trying to hear things, I try and imagine I'm in the space. It's dark. I'm sitting in a theater or something or a concert hall. And I know the musicians in front of me because I know what ensemble I'm writing for. And I try and capture the moments. And mm -hmm. that's really what it's about for me, at least from my perspective. I don't sit at a piano like all the uh, you know old school uh, uh, visual ways of composers you know working through it do right, right. To me, the piano actually distracts me i just need to like be in silence and just get lost in that that moment that makes sense wow that's that yeah that's so cool i mean i get it the trope of uh you know prince sitting behind a piano playing purple rain after his father just beat up his mother <laughs> you know these are very cinematic thinkings but yeah. uh, but but yet, you know, you just mentioned a second ago that you visualize what that audience is experiencing when you're playing. Like that's a huge part of your, you know, your creative process is how will a listener receive this? Yeah, I, I mean, I picture I'm the listener. Um, wow, and, it's so cool. Yeah, like, uh, and that's why sometimes I should also mention this. Each piece is a milestone. And the more you focus on that one piece, the more difficult it is for you to see things objectively, right? So um, what I'll need to do is I'll actually need to step away from a piece if I've been working on it for more than a month or so and just get away from it completely, cut off, like cut off my relationship with that piece. So when I experience it again or when I look at it again, I can look at it with fresh ears, fresh eyes, fresh perspective, and see things that I wouldn't see before, if that makes sense. It, it does. I'm, I'm, I'm literally, you're like counseling me right now. This, <laughs> this is great stuff, Nick, because yeah, you know, I don't know any artist that, that really approaches that, that there's an, a weird, crazy, unhealthy obsession with creation, especially when um, it seems like every artist I know feels like they're on a deadline, even when they're not right. And, and it's really easy to get caught up in trying to figure out the bits and pieces that don't feel quite right. But you know, if you can just tweak it two to 3%, that's going to be the thing that sets it into orbit, you know? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. So since you're such an intensely positive guy, clearly well-mannered and skill sets for days, um, a, a new question in my fold is this, which is what would you consider to be your most self-destructive habit? You know, what's your biggest negative? Uh, health wise, I would say and I stopped this for a while. I, I tore my ACL in June of 2021. Oh, um, doing jujitsu. Uh, I was rolling with one of my buddies. He's, he's huge. He's like 300 pounds. He's really good. And um, I tore my ACL and it made me realize that there are some things in my life I need to change. Um, this is in 2021. So I was like drinking every day and drinking beer. So I got rid of my kegerator. That's the first step. <laughs> uh, my doctor was like, you're not going to heal. This ACL is not going to heal if you drink beer every day, even if it's one or two beers like I was doing. Um, so that's one thing I stopped. Then I started fasting after 7 p.m. So my body can cleanse and heal itself. I did all these healthy things. Mm -hmm. And I would say those are probably the most. And now I'm kind of getting back. I have to say I'm getting back into drinking a beer every other day. Now I have a beer when I'm making dinner. On a Monday, Wednesday, Friday kind of schedule, maybe Saturday. <laughs> um, okay. I, I've been really bad at eating. My, my wife, she's like such a bad influence on in me because she's like in great shape and doesn't have to try. Okay. And so in the middle of the night, she eats just, she's like a raccoon, like hogging dos bars. And, mm. But, anyways, that's one bad thing as I eat junk food um, at night. Um, that's health wise. I would say mental wise, what I do is, I think my obsessive behavior into creating things um, leads me to spending money on things I don't need to spend money just to learn a new skill. So I'm wow. buying a drill press just to like do machine work. And I've always been interested in that. And I'm building an ADU right now, which is a mm -hmm. accessory dwelling unit. Mm -hmm. And that's a very expensive lumber is like a lot right now. 
So I don't know if these are, this is almost like me trying to find a, these are things that I think most people don't get involved with, but I do. Um, right. It has to do with me being a composer. I like to create and get obsessed about things, mm. the creation. And it ends up being a very expensive hobby. And I might move on to a different hobby. Like I'll just jump hobby to hobby to hobby, you know, and try to get as good as I can with something. Mm -hmm. And if I feel like, okay, that was awesome. Now I have that skill or whatever. I'll move on to something else. Yeah. You know? It's interesting though. I love how you're you've classified these things as self destructive when most people wish wish they did those things, right? Like <laughs> worked out too much, obsessed, <laughs> obsessed over a new drill. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but I can see how you know I can see certainly how that can get in the way. That gets in the way of you know connecting with family. Um, you know when your when your private time, your personal time that could be given elsewhere is just spent on you focusing on your latest obsession that's it and i think that's you, you just nailed it so me focusing on my own personal obsessions which are skill sets mm -hmm. is really selfish it's me taking and that's why i got i stopped composing for a while i felt like i was removing myself from time i can be spending with my newborn child you know mm -hmm. um so now i try and do all these things all these skills at times when my kids are in school, the first half of my day is like booked. I'm teaching martial arts, doing martial arts, doing one of my skill sets, doing private lessons, all that stuff. When my kids are home, that's when I try and dedicate, you know, dad time and, you know, mm. doing stuff at home. Mm -hmm. So, okay. May I ask one more question around that? Sure. Okay. So as a father, I'm going to use myself again. I find that I am extraordinarily selfish and that I still want what I want when I want it. And I have greatly struggled with this my entire life. And people say, like, well, just change. Well, <laughs> you know, I don't necessarily know how to do that. I So in other words, like, um, I'm a big fan of disc golf. Love, love disc golf. So, of course, what do I do? I take my kids out disc golfing because I want them to love that sport as much as me. But the truth is, is they rarely want to go. And when they do go, they tend to complain a bit. And I'm thinking... You're getting time with your dad. I didn't even get this. You know what I mean? I didn't even get that you know, so that immediacy. And yet it's really me sort of impressing my will upon them. Um, you as a father, how do you separate, you know, what what Nick wants versus teaching your kids what you know? Yeah, man, we, I we definitely do the same thing. I well, our daughter, Madison, she got into jujitsu at age five or six. Mm -hmm. And she, we definitely pushed that hobby on her, but she loved it. And she, I, when COVID hit, she stopped, but we're going to start her again. Oh, okay. Um, my son, Lucas, I definitely got him into all the things I wish I had as a kid. And that's what happens too. You kind of give them things that you didn't have. So I, I built Madison uh, um, a Power Wheels Barbie Jeep, right? And I made, and that's another obsessive thing. So when I get into things for my kids, I have to get really good at doing that thing. So I built it with a more powerful motor. So it goes three times as fast as it's supposed to probably not safe or whatever, but um, yeah. and then with Lucas, yeah, I got him into transformers. I got him into Robotech. I got him in all these things that I, I was into when I was a kid. So you're going to like this stuff too. Mm -hmm. They're into the eighties. they like back to the future they're into the goonies like kind of made them relive my childhood and giving them things that wish i had like this is i'm so guilty of this i thought of something that could be a tie to the earlier question so i didn't have any video games as a kid mm -hmm. and i built them an arcade room my kids oh I, my gosh I built cabinets and learned how to code them so they play every single rom emulator from Atari <laughs> all the way to Nintendo 64 and stuff. <laughs> Congratulations. That's a good dad. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty bad. I mean, I'm like probably spoiling them, but I, I took one away. So that's one thing. I'm like, no, you guys have too many. I'm taking one away. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so how to balance that? Um, I'm trying to teach them things that I wish I knew as a kid and still trying to see what they're into. But um, I definitely think that as a parent, we can all get better. We can all improve. 
yeah um and learn things from our kids and also from other parents so i see parents do things in a totally different direction they push their kids to do whatever only outdoor stuff all the time you know i want to i want to balance i want my kids to be you know able to do uh, uh academics well but also be physical when they need to you know yeah um yeah. it's hard man being a parent learning how to balance that's that's the battle yeah yeah a lot of comedians joke about it you know they say like oh parents people saying like parenting is the hardest job in the world i don't it's obviously not technically the hardest job in the world but emotionally and spiritually good gravy man it's you know the 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 investment of your of your internal resources is massive and i always feel like i'm failing you know no matter what i do i mean i feel like that about everything i feel like that about this you know what i mean just everything and like it's never good enough yeah. but i yeah i i do stress about um creating a, a good environment for the kids when i feel i'm definitely not doing so so to hear you talk about the the you know trying to find that happy medium between indoor outdoor activities technical and artistic um it yeah. sounds like you're doing it right brother i'm trying man i'm uh if and your kids kind of lead you like where they want to go mm -hmm. right like madison was such a good like into singing like early on like oh maybe she's going to be into this but then you know they <laughs> you know how it works they change their hobby or their thing every year you know mm -hmm. my little pony no i'm into this now dad i'm like oh sorry i'm gonna follow <laughs> that now you know <laughs> yeah we live here in the northwest and uh so every time the sun comes out they change their mind <laughs> oh yeah, Dude, yeah you, you're in, my, my sister lives in seattle now oh, okay yeah it seems and i could be incorrect but it seems um through the content in your material this this latest record specifically um that there's a lot of contemporary spiritualism in it um and i and i could have i could be way off but i'm wondering why that occurs and how does that translate to you personally so i guess the question is do you do you look at the world through these spiritualized eyes or is this just simply a facet that you're currently interested in and you want to express it um man it's weird if I, you ask me if you ask me that question at different points in the last ten years, you get a different answer. Mm -hmm. I think for each of those pieces, it might be slightly different. So, to me, the most like music, sound, or whatever, it can say things that we can't say in words, right? Mm -hmm. And so, when I think about spirituality, there's some there's some things that people just feel or just know. And they can't express those in words. Right. So for me, when I wrote like Einsoff, Einsoff is is based on the energy before there was a God, right? That primordial something. Mm -hmm. And to make that energy or that that sound, I needed to capture something that no one's like ever heard before. So I had everyone in the orchestra randomly grab um, an empty bottle glass bottle from home it could be wine beer snapple i don't care and i wanted to practice blowing through it now what happens is you have an orchestra of untuned natural acoustic aerophones that when played together will sound quite like no other note you've ever heard before Un mm -hmm. unearthly unworldly like an energy some energy you can't even put in words what a great but, idea yeah you can't notate that chord so um yeah for me spirituality is just feeling something feeling one with something right mm -hmm. um, connecting with something deeply like it can be spiritual and not religious at all mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um like martial arts for me is very spiritual um mm -hmm. it's me connecting with myself and my body and knowing how to use my body um music is the same way it's like knowing how to tune your energy or something mm -hmm. right. yeah you know this is the second time i've had somebody talk about something similar to what you talked about about this this combination of notes it's like a choir an untuned choir but if you get enough voices going somehow that 
uh, all the all those sound waves collide in a beautiful accidental. It's beautiful cacophony. If that's, yes. if, if that's yes. such a thing. Yeah. And and I was reading something, um, and then I heard a commercial about this years ago that was about DNA. That scientists have assigned musical notes to DNA. Have you heard about this? No. Yeah, you should check this out. There's stuff on YouTube. I can't I can't remember the name at the moment, but if you type like um, DNA music notes, I think. Um, so scientists have discovered this is incredible, Nick. Yeah. That if you assign any note, any note to DNA strands, right? So like a you know D sharp is you know this this particular part of the DNA strand, and then you know. A sharp is this over here, right? Yeah. The point being is, is that if you then play the DNA strand like a like an old uh, piano yeah. uh, player piano, yeah, ev everything is perfectly corded. Yeah, it's like it's like your your DNA cannot play an atonal thing. It's so incredible. I, I'm 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 thinking this is what's happening because so what I studied also was spectral music. Mm. I think our DNA and our bodies have a natural tuning where the fundamental note will give the offspring to all these natural partials. And the major scale actually exists in the natural partial or the overtone series. So there are people, of course, who have had near-death experiences. We don't know what they're experiencing. So, I mean, uh, you know, a Christian is going to think he's seen the face of God. You know what I mean? Or oh, see yeah. Jesus. Uh, yeah. Somebody else is going to think it's Allah. Somebody else is going to think it's Buddha, whatever. But the point is that they're all saying the same thing about one thing, which is I heard music and it sounded like every note played at the same time and there was no dissonance. Oh, wow. Yeah. And and so I think about what you're creating. And then the fact, Nick, that you just mentioned the fundamental note and then the partials is proof that we there's something incredible and divine about us. So whether what regardless of what name you put to your creator, I mean, I grew up in the Christian church. I mean, I'm going to I'm going to go in that direction because it's just who I am and what I know. Um but but I, I I love the fact, and I guess this is what it gets down to. I love the fact that I'm talking to this great guy that I just met 40 minutes ago, who has who's thoughtful and understands that there's something hidden and complex inside of him, and he can't. And none of us really know what it means, but it's there. It's it's intrinsic. It's it's inherent. It was born into us. It's who we are, and we should leverage it. Yeah. Yep. That's cool, man. I mean, I didn't even think about it until you asked me. Mm. Um, but yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely something in humans that is musically related or vibrationally related, right. something with the universe, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah. And, and so I guess to close, I, I would say that then what we should do in all circumstances is we should seek out the thing that that we have in common right we shouldn't be looking at what separates us because that's what you know that's what the news does that's what culture does it says oh i see that guy i don't like that guy because x right um i don't like that guy because of the color of his skin i don't like that guy because the kind of music he listens to i don't like that guy because he's 20 years younger than me and he can't possibly be as intelligent as i etc 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 and the reality is is we should say what is it about you, Nick, that makes you so intriguing? What is it that, you know, that pulls me towards your gravity, you know? And, and I think it's that hidden thing, that beautiful, unintentional, accidental art that's hidden in all of us. Some of us pursue it, some of us don't. But I'm just grateful to know guys like you who are killing it for the world because, dude, you, you make some incredible stuff. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. So look, I, I gotta let you go. I know it's uh, it, you're you're rushing off, and I'm rushing off too. But I want to say thank you so much. And did you have a good time today? Yeah, you know, you got me to like think and talk about things that I don't normally. I think this is probably one of the most thoughtful and interesting and intriguing podcas I've done yet. So oh. kudos to you for great oh. questions and everything, man. <laughs>